this is Danae from Anything for Geeks, and today we are going to talk about the Devonian period, and this is a part of human evolution. And the Devonian period was a very important period in the history of time. So, why was it that important? Keep watching to find out. So, let's get started. Uh, the Devonian period comes directly after the Silurian period. And to recap, in the Silurian, we had um, fish, we had the first uh, jawed fish, and now everything can begin chomping on everything else. Uh, we have the first vascular plants, and if you remember, vascular means that these plants had stems roots and some form of leaves and mostly vascular plants are um, like they live on land and in the Silurian we had the Karoo Ice Age which was caused by too much of plants that took in too much carbon dioxide turning the world into a giant snowball version of itself and we also had the first permanent animal on land uh, which was very important a millipede called Pneumodesmus, and today we are going to continue on those on those topics. Uh, first, the jawed fish. Jawed fish um, were very, very, very uh, common and prolific during the Devonian. The Devonian period is actually known as the age of fish, and even the age of sharks, which sounds uh, creepy and kind of foreboding. Uh, but anyways, uh, there were a lot of fish in the Devonian, and most of them were jawed. All, most of the jawless fish had gone extinct by this time, uh, driven to extinction by their jawed cousins, who promptly ate them up and outcompeted with them. And now the only jawless fish are the ancestors of hagfishes and lampreys. More on that later. But among the jawed fish themselves, there were now um, many major splits. The cartilaginous fish, which include sharks, um, animal, animals like rays, and skates, like man rays, stingrays, and stuff like that. They were beginning, or they were not beginning, but they had fully diverged from the bony fish. And... You may remember the placoderms, which are big bony fish with plates. Well, they were they were pretty big during the Devonian. Uh, for example, Dungliosteus was the largest um, fish in, in the Devonian, and it was a placoderm, and it did not have. A teeth. It had bony plates. If you may remember, this is common to all placoderms, and Dungliosteus was covered in thick, heavy armor made of bone. And while it wasn't very fast, it was certainly powerful, and it was very feared in the Devonian. Um, a Dungliose Dungliosteus was very big, and so it was basically the apex predator. And um, the tables were actually turned on the marine arthropods. Um, you might remember the Eurypterids from the uh, Ordovician and the Silurian videos in which they pretty much terrorized everything around them. Well, the, well now that the fish were big, um, like Dungliosteus, Dungliosteus was just eating every single Eurypterid it could find. And so Eurypterids, uh, who were once the top of the food chain, uh, are now brought to almost like the very bottom I and mean, plants are basically the very bottom here and then like plankton but near the bottom so um, Eurypterids are now the primary consumers and if you don't know what a primary consumer is uh, a primary consumer is at the bottom of the food chain and it eats plants or like plankton or or, but it eats the bottom of the food chain, whatever's in the bottom of the food chain is directly eaten by the primary consumer. And every other consumer eats the primary consumer. So basically now everything eats Eurypterids. 
and so Eurotrid is eating everything else. And Dunleosteus, uh, while it may look like a shark at first glance, and it certainly um, took the role of modern great white, uh, Dunleosteus was not a shark. Sharks Sharks were extremely common during the Devonian, and they were secondary consumers. They ate the primary consumers, but uh, higher consumers e ate them. And so Dunleosteus would have would eaten a lot of sharks. Uh, for example, one shark is Cladislaki, which actually um, wasn't a shark. It was a radfish, and, and radfish are a very weird group of cartilaginous fish related to sharks. Uh, all mainly, uh, many of the uh, fish that uh, were like really big and were major predators during the Devonian and uh, in the following periods were actually ratfish. But uh, today's ratfish uh, live in the bottom of the ocean. They're in, like this big. They're very pale, and they look very, very, very strange. Uh, more on that later. We had Cladosalaki, the uh, the shark that was not a shark, and uh, we actually had a uh, real sharks and fake sharks, all kinds of sharks. The cartilaginous fish were very common, and we also had a lot of bony fish, excluding the plagrims, like the bony fish that we think of today, like the salmon and tuna. Like there were no salmon and tuna, but uh, sal the ancestors of salmon and tuna were on their way during the Devonian. And in the Devonian, here's where a very big split happens between in the bony fish. Um, Back during the Devonian, uh, there are now two kinds of fins, uh, pectoral fins. Now, pectoral fins are basically the ancestors of arms. They are the fins uh, that grow from the shoulder and into the sides of fish. And pectoral fins are used for uh, swimming. Like to, uh, they're used for power. And pectoral fins are actually the pectoral fins are more used for steering, and pectoral fins were had may uh, like pectoral fins underwent a major change during the Devonian period. So until this time, pectoral fins weren't really important. Uh, pectoral fins were like these tiny little lumps on the side of the fish. But now you had two major kinds of uh, pectoral fins. Both were uh, very important. One was the ray fin. And, and these are more common today. A ray finned fish are what we mainly think of when we think of fish. Uh, salmon have ray fins. Um, tuna have ray fins. Like um, mackerel, sardines, herring, and stuff like that. Uh, bonitos. They all are ray finned fish. The piranhas, for example, or, or trout. Um, trout would work. Like, uh, mainly a lot of fish that we think of, like carp, catfish, a pike. They're all ray finned fish. And a ray fin fish means that a, the ray fin has very thin bones to support the fin, and then there's a thin membrane structure holding the bones together, and that's a ray fin. It's not particularly strong, it's actually pretty easy to tear, but it's much more lighter and much more efficient in the water, and it provides a much more better steering. But the other type, the lobe fin, is equally important. The lobe fin means you still got the bones, but they're thicker, and you've got a whole little chunk of flesh surrounding those bones. So they basically um, didn't change much from the small lumps that were the first pectoral fins, except that they got very big, like these lumps. Uh, once they were lumps, now they were big lumps. But these big lumps are very important um, in hum human evolution because these big lumps, 
they're the ancestors of arms. And today there are some lobe finned fishes, uh, like lobe finned fish, as you say. Um, for example, the coelacanth, which lives in the waters of the Indian Ocean uh, off the coast of Mo Mo Mozambique in Africa and in, like generally in tropical areas in that region. And the uh, coelacanth is a it's actually silicanes are basically living fossils. Uh, living fossils are basically animals that were thought to have been extinct but actually miraculously survived to today. Uh, silicanes haven't changed much since uh, the, uh, the age of the dinosaurs actually. And silicanes, uh, silicanes actually evolved during the Devonian period, and that means that silicanes are older than dinosaurs, and they've been around uh, after dinosaurs, and they're still silicanes, and silicanes are very endangered. There are also like lungfish. Lungfish live in Africa and South America. For example, of the many lungfish. Um, are found in Africa, and these lungfish, their special ability is they have both gills. Gills are common for every fish that makes them able to breathe in water. But lungfish, um, as you might have guessed by their name, also have lungs, which means they are able to breathe air on land. And lungfish are members of the lobe fin fishes, their fins are very fleshy and chunky. And, and um, one offshoot from this, um, the lobe fin fishes, would actually become pioneers and be the first vertebrates on land, eventually leading to us, the dinosaurs, mammals, um, birds, whatnot. And these Fish are very important in the history of time and life because otherwise humans as a species would not have existed. I'm not uh, counting uh, dozens, like millions of other species. But, and I would not be here to tell you about this and you would not be here to listen unless uh, humans were some other sort of intelligent species that evolved uh, separately from Earth and just happened to came and come here and settle down. And but it's most likely that this is not the case and so mm, these fish are very important. Now who are these uh, unnamed pioneers? Well, well, they'll no longer be unnamed now. Uh, Tiktaalik was one of these fish. It, it's the earliest fish that were found. Uh, that had the capability to go on land, and Tiktaalik was found in the Arctic, as are the other two main pioneers that I'm going to list here. Uh, Tiktaalik was, in all respects, a fish. It was no reptile. It, it kind of looked like a salamander, but its legs, there were no legs, there were just fins. It could probably drag itself onto land and back to water, but more than that, um, nothing. But these other two um, fish, or they're actually amphibians now, uh, they evolved more and their fins started separating um, into tiny hands with uh, no fingers and toes, and they began to walk straight on land, and they basically looked like oversized salamanders, and they were in all respects oversized salamanders, except um, they weren't salamanders. And these two uh, amphibians are Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, and the funny thing is, actually this is very weird and funny, the funny thing is that Ichthyostega had eight fingers on, or eight toes on each leg. And now most vertebrates have five fingers or toes on each limb. Uh, some have four, and the birds and dinosaurs had three. 
but there's never usually more than five unless it's there's like you know a physical disorder like you know there's a condition called polyphalangy but we're pretty sure that it that the atheistic specimens were just affected with polyphalangy this appear to be a natural a finger and usually in polyphalangy it's just an extra one finger here we have three extra fingers on each every limb and this is not symptomatic of polyphalangy and so we know that atheistega did have in fact eight toes and that actually means that the a five or less toe rule among vertebrates evolved after Ichthyostega came onto land. And this is actually very weird because until the discovery of Ichthyostega and its close relatives, paleontologists and scientists as a general thought that vertebrates could only have five toes. Um, it was just a natural law. They didn't know why. They had no reason, but it, it was just so because they had never found anything like Ichthyostega before. And the other significance of this is that these lungfish, when they're able to breathe onto land, they breathe on in on land and breathe air. That means that they um, open up a whole new ecosystem. Until now, the eco ecosystem on land consisted of a few plants, like you know, horse tails and stuff, and uh, some insects, you know, millipedes, and, and like butterflies, spiders, uh, that kind of stuff. But now, with the introduction of Tiktaalik and Ichthyostega and Acanthostega on land, we have a whole new um, set of species that are ready to adapt to the ecosystem and become the apex predators there, um, evolve into new species, blah, blah, blah. But this means that, la that land is now as populated as the water. And now you might be wondering, like, why do these fish even need um, to go onto land? Like, couldn't they just have stick stuck to the water? Like, that's what fish do. They swim in the water. Why did these fish need to come on to land and the reason is there were just simply too much fish swimming around in the water so um, I mentioned earlier that arthropods ruled over fish in during like most of the Cambrian or Vishian and Silurian and because of that fish just remained at the bottom of the food web and they did not have any chance to diversify it, the main difference among Jones fish was some difference in the head shield. Um, you had species like Cephalaspis and Arundaspis, which just look basically the same, and they occupy similar niches in the ecosystem. Uh, but after the arthropods went on to land, what happened was there was just fish left in the ocean, and then then what happened was fish. It's, it's, took the opportunity and started evolving very rapidly and that is how you get oversized giants that would absolutely demolish modern ecosystems like Dungliosteus and that's also how you get sharks and rayfin fish and loafin fish and everything really but what happened was there were still other animals and now that there were like so many fish uh, and and um, here's the thing, many fish were still similar, like there were huge groups of fish that are very similar, like huge families with t like tons of species. And that meant that there were actually more fish than there were places for the fish in the ecosystem. And that mean that, that e either meant that some fish would have to just die, or they would have to clear out of the water and go someplace else. And that someplace else was land. Land was the only ecosystem that was still available to them. Um, obviously, we were not there, and thus we had not invented rockets or spaceships or, you know, liquid hydrogen or anything like that that would en enable anybody to get to space and find other planets. 
and so Leand was the only option left to them. And and thus we have fish coming onto land. Fish now become amphibians as they can walk on land. And in the next video, the amphibians become reptiles. And reptiles lead to even more reptiles, which lead to even more reptiles, and then mammals. And mammals lead finally to us. But I'm afraid it's not that simple. Uh, more on that in the next video. And now we need to cover our plants. We haven't covered plants at all, and plants are going to be important in the next video, which means that we've got to start it off in this video. And something important happened during the Devonian. We had the first tree. And the first tree wasn't really a tree by modern classification, but it was still big enough to be classified as a tree. It was actually more closely related to horse tails, and its name was Watiza. I, do, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but uh, I think it's Watiza or Watiza. Uh, Watiza is better. I'm never going to call it Watiza. And Watiza was found in New York State. A uh, way to go, New York. But uh, Watiza was the first tree by definition of a tree, which is a large woody plant. But it wasn't closely related to any trees that we know today, and it was not the ancestor of any trees that we know today. Instead, it was a close relative of horse tails. Horse tails are like these tiny little plants that actually do not look anything like a horse's tail. I have no idea why people chose to call it a horse tail when it looks nothing like a horse tail. It actually looks kind of like a broom, um, or not like a broom, but like it actually looks more like a plant version of a duster. And horse tails grow near rivers, streams. Uh, they're water plants, and they grow in lakes. Um, anywhere there's water, like there's anywhere there's fresh water. Uh, these horse tails can grow, and Watiza was basically a giant horse tail. Um, and horse tails are vascular plants. Uh, horse tails have like these tiny little stems and branches, and basically, it looked Watiza looked like a tree, but it was in reality a giant horse tail. And this actually, this gigantism uh, comes. Oh, in the next video and it is very important it's going to be very important in the next video this a uh, gigantism of tiny plants but more on that later so uh, what Tiza the New York or uh, what Tiza uh, was the first tree it was a horse tail and trees meant that there could be more herbivores but the trees were so big that there was a really very minimal damage and that meant more ecosystems. But uh, something happened. Uh, the, I mean, these trees they grew, and these trees, they would have led to the Karoo Ice Age happening again, but luckily we had fish arrive on the spot, and so they could become like you know, omnivores. And then there were bigger bugs, and um, a lot of stuff like that happening. More on that in the next video, though, because things are going to get quite interesting in the next video, really. And uh, to recap, uh, finally, we have... So we had Dungliosius, we had the class Slacky, uh, we had the split between uh, ray fin fishes and low fin fish, uh, we had Tiktaalik, uh, Watiza, the first tree, which is not a tree. Uh, we have a lot of things that are not what they seem to be <laughs> in the Devonian period. And, oh yeah, we had, like, a new ecosystems, you know, uh, the reason that fish went on to land, uh, blah, blah, blah. And join us next time for the Carboniferous period, so cold because it provides, like, 99% of the world's coal supply. And coal, if you paid attention in chemistry class, is a compound of carbon. See you later. 
As always, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment, or watch more videos on my channel. And next time, stay tuned for the Carboniferous. Bye!